and we're live. Actually, are we live or are we recording? Taylor, how the hell You're are recording. You? Hey. <laughs> um, we are not live, but we're recording live. So this is happening live, but as a recording. Anyway. It's happening live for us, you know? Yeah, exactly. And you can see it live later. It's live recorded. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. But um, we will uh, be talking today about um, the art fair. There'll be a series of sessions we'll highlight. And this one will be about the mister and what you're calling the micro living room of the 90s or the 90s micro living room, which I love the title of. Um, but let's before we get to the actual installation, maybe it might be useful, Taylor, for you to set up for uh, the folks listening. What is, in fact, a mister? And how did you fall down the rabbit hole of that particular technology? Yeah, yeah. So the Mister is a um, is a sort of retro computing and retro gaming device. Um, it is kind of Raspberry Pi like in that it's like a single computer board, basically. Um, and uh, but but the there's a community that's built up around it, and actually there's. I'll, I'll show mine in a second, but there's uh, additional boards that can stick to it that expand its capabilities. We, and I'm only saying that to say, you're going to look at that and be like, that's not a single board, Taylor. That's multiple things. But my point is, it's a very compact device, kind of like a Raspberry Pi, um, if you're familiar with that. But um, but the, I got into this device from actually, like I'm, I'm really into uh, like, video game stuff and retro video game stuff and um the mister keeps pop kept popping up on my radar of like oh like th this is interesting device that can do all of these old consoles it can emulate old consoles it can emulate old computers um and it does it very accurately and um it's relatively simple to use and i say relatively because it is like a hobbyist linux device uh, you know, so again, if you're familiar with the Raspberry Pi, it's kind of like using that. I actually think it's a little bit easier to work with than a Raspberry Pi in a lot of ways. Um, but it isn't something that you can just buy and then, you know, plug into a TV and be like, cool, it plays games like there's some tinkering. But I came upon it from actually uh, 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 GiantBomb.com, which is like a video games review site. One of the folks there... Um, gone now one of the founders of it uh had like a series of videos where he would like just tinker with old computers and old consoles and usually obscure things like he was like let's play some msx games which is like a japanese computer that microsoft was involved with i don't really know a lot about the msx but my point was it really piqued my curiosity of like this is a cool way to kind of play with some of these older platforms that i sort of don't have a lot of familiarity with especially and it does all these old retro console things, which was uh, exciting to me. Um, the FPGA itself, I'm not a computer scientist, far from it. But basically, it can do in hardware what we do um, with software emulation a lot of times. So if, if folks are familiar with things that can play like old NES games, and you can load it up on your computer, and you give it a ROM file to play, it's doing that, but it's doing it with a FPGA chip, which basically the someone writes instructions for the chip and describes various parts of the NES in programming language to this chip, and that chip sort of becomes more like an NES, for example. Um, and so it, it's just a sort of a different path, but it means that it can do some really amazing things and very accurately, um, and, and it, the, all in this little tiny device. Yeah, and in the game emulation world, right? Like there's emulation through software and then there's fpga which for many is like next level like there's yeah even in the retro arcade cabinets or even the original ones there's discussions around can you put an fpga board in there or not and i think it's the only board people will even discuss like a mame computer or something like that is out of the question but fpga depending on who you talk to is a possibility yeah, it's it's basically it it's it's imagine a processor that you can tell it how it should work after you make it basically with just simple uh, well I shouldn't say simple it's probably hugely complex but uh, with with lines of code basically so you you tell it how to work 
So exactly how an FPGA works and all of the nitty gritties of it, I don't know a lot about, but I can just tell you that the, F the emulation is really good. It does it at a very low latency, so I can play uh, games that I remember from like the SNES and they feel like they did, <laughs> um, it, to, to my brain anyway. And uh, the other cool thing about the Mister is that there's these add-on boards, and I have one as well, that adds analog output to the, the Mister. So you can plug it, of course, into like an HDMI TV and do all kinds of things with it. And it's really good for that. It actually does, um, it uh, on digital displays, it can, it can overcome a lot of the latency issues that they often have with using other emulators, um, or it does it better anyway. But that analog output is amazing because you can plug in that, that VGA port I showed. is isn't really a VGA port. It's capable of a lot of different things with various adapters you can get online. Um, I've used it to plug it in directly into CRT TVs, so you can have this modern tiny computer plugging into an old CRT, and it looks amazing and, and authentic. And then when you fire up an emulator, it it's really hard to tell that from the real thing, in my opinion. Um, I but you can also plug it into old computer monitors as well, and that's what I actually have at home. Is I have an old uh, VGA computer monitor isn't really the same thing as an old CRT TV. I mean, it, it is a CRT, but um, they, they are slightly different um, in, in various what you can use them for and what they're good at. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of how I found out about the device. And then when I got the thing, I found out that one of the cool cores it, it could do, one of the things it could pretend to be was a 486 PC in its entirety, which is kind of amazing to me because if you know anything about how PC, like how, you know, general purpose computers work, like the ones you and I are talking to each other through, there aren't just one chip, right? It, it's a lot. And, and to be fair, neither was even an NES, but there were a lot of very complex chips. So the fact that they could even do this on a single FPGA is kind of amazing to me. Um, in that, and so I, I was like, okay, well, what can you do with this 486 computer? And keep in mind, a 486 is like, an early 90s PC, uh, um, so probably like 91 through, I, I'm not exactly a historian here, but but the early half of the 90s, basically. Yeah, 93, 94 for sure, yeah. 95. You would, when Windows 95, you would be 486. Probably on a 486, that was about the time Pentiums shape. were coming out, yeah. and a lot of people running Windows 95 would have been using a Pentium PC, but uh, which was quite a bit faster. But anyway, so it's that just, it's like between Windows 3.1 and Windows 95. Um, but, and you can definitely run both of those things really well on a 486. Um, which, so I did a stream, man, a year and a half ago. It was when, it was when you and I were, well, I guess you had been playing with PeerTube for a while. I was just starting to play with PeerTube. Um, and so I did a little test stream of, just checking my OBS setup out. I believe I did this in like the on like New Year's Eve. Um, yeah, let, let me pull the video up. It's one of the earliest things on my PeerTube, and uh, it, the whole thing's like forty minutes long, and it's mostly just me like trying things out in OBS, making sure audio is working and stuff like that. But one of the things I did in here is I hooked up a bunch of different cameras. I hooked up actually a, a document camera facing down. Um, so I could kind of show this device off. And I also hooked up the output of the Mr. into OBS as well. So I could, you know, use it and demo it. And one of the things I, um, I, I messed with a lot of things. I played some arcade uh, cores that it has um, installed. I played uh, SNES games a little bit. Um, and I messed around with a Commodore 64, um, which was kind of neat. And then I showed off what I had been playing with, which was this Windows 95 install um, that someone had posted a, um, a instructions on how to use a virtual dial-up device. So you can run Windows 95 and then use this virtual dial-up device to connect to the real actual internet, uh, <laughs> which is inadvisable <laughs> for security reasons, but a lot of fun <laughs> also. <laughs> um, so, you know, don't do your banking on it. <laughs> um, yeah, and maybe exactly. don't leave it connected all the time. But, you know, anyway. 
But what I found out pretty quickly was that, hey, like the modern internet doesn't really work on Windows 95, or at least not the modern web, the way we think of it, right? Anything that works over HTTPS is not going to work here because the basically the encryption ciphers, uh, basically the things that allow it to decrypt the, the certificates that tell your browser, hey, this is a HTTPS site and it's okay to visit and it's secure, they're, they haven't been updated. They, they're very old versions of these things. So they don't work. And I think in some cases, the browsers don't even support HTTPS at, at this point um, in, in some cases. So anyway, most sites do not work because most sites are HTTPS. So then uh, later on, um, bec uh, on uh, um, or actually, I guess it would have been before this stream because I did demo it in this stream. I also found out that um, that there's this service called the Old Net, um, and I saw a YouTube video about this where someone was using it with like a real, honest to God, actual. I think it was like a Windows 98 computer that they had somehow rigged up to to work over Wi-Fi, um, and uh, so they. This is a browser proxy. So basically, you can go here and you can visit like. Sure, let's visit Nintendo.com from 1996. This is what it looked like. And it's very much like the Wayback Machine, if you're familiar. I know you are, Jim, with the Wayback Machine. Um, and in fact, it's, cert it's using the Wayback Machine's, the Internet Archive's old copies of pages. But the neat thing about this is that it doesn't put all that web UI around the Wayback Machine. And it's actually somehow faster. I don't know. Archive.org is always kind of a slow website for me. Um, and what they, so you can browse it like we are here, which is neat. Um, but even cooler, they have a actual, uh, proxy proxy service. And so you can go in here and you basically set some settings up in your browser and you can directly browse this thing. You can do this with a modern computer, by the way, you can plug these settings into Chrome or Firefox and this will work. But I was like, Oh, what if I, fired up Netscape on Windows 95 on this mister, dialed up to the real internet, and then set up this proxy inside of mister. And so that's what I did, and it worked beautifully. Um, it, it, it required some tinkering and, uh, and things like that, but um, it, was, it works. So um, here is me kind of messing with this. Um, this is me setting it up on this stream. And then, you know, loading some old web pages. And this is the first time I had really tried this. Um, this old net proxy thing was on this stream. So I was, it's kind of cool for me watching this now because I was like, oh my God, this actually works. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's slow, but so was the internet at the time, you know? Um, so that was sort of how I got to, hey, what if we set up like some kind of thing where people could literally, experience the web of like let's say 1997 pick a year basically um and you know on this mr device i had this fpga device um and we could actually properly you know have people just literally use netscape navigator 3.0 to look at pages from a certain year and so that was my original proposal for the conference for the art fair i should say which was to say what if I set this thing up and wouldn't that be fun, right? Like, um, and you looked at that and you go, that's a 90s living room or that's a centerpiece to a 90s living room and that's what we should do. Um, and so that's kind of, kind of took off from there. So I, I messed around with plugging my mister into my PC, my old CRT monitor. I have a Sony Trinitron uh, 20 inch. It's a beautiful monitor, honestly. Um, and so I, I plugged it in. I was like, hey, this works on this monitor too, so we could have it look more authentic. And um, then you and, and Meredith uh, and I uh, coordinated to get all the stuff for the 90s living room going, right? So um, I found um, Meredith and I uh, scoured eBay to find a old uh, era appropriate computer uh, tower, which we weren't actually using the computer there, but we wanted it there sell the 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 whole thing right and then crucially we wanted a monitor i wasn't going to fly with my pc monitor across the country so uh we bought one uh it got shipped to meredith's house and she tested it out 
Um, and then I brought a retro looking keyboard and mouse, basically. I, it needed it to be USB to plug into the Mister, um, but I wanted it to look uh, appropriate. And I also brought some equipment basically to solve the networking issue of trying to do this not in my home. So doing proxies and Windows 95 and virtual dial-up connections all over a Wi-Fi connection on a college campus, hard to do. <laughs> um, I, I do say I, I want to blog maybe some of the technicals of this, but basically the way I got this actually working away from my home was and it wouldn't work over hotspot of my phone directly because of the proxy situation. So I had a tiny router, my phone, and the mister. The mister connected via Wi-Fi to this tiny router. The tiny router ran a VPN connection uh, over WireGuard back to my house that I have set up for my own use already. Um, and then the router got an internet connection from my phone uh, over um, hotspot. So it was basically a relay of two Wi-Fi networks <laughs> over cellular and a VPN just to make this happen. Um, and but I'm glad Where it was it the worked. router. Uh, was it was the router just, it's a tiny you little had? router. It was just yeah. I I actually I realized it wasn't going to doing some testing when we got to UMW. Um, I realized that uh, it wasn't going to work on that Wi-Fi network, so I Amazon ordered a a router and got it delivered to the hotel in time for the art fair. <laughs> so really, um, yeah, it was a, just a little cheap travel router. It's like literally slightly bigger than the Mister, and it was just plugged in. And then that, it's all over Wi-Fi, so it didn't have to be on the desk or anything. And that pointed to your My VPN. Phone. Yes. Your phone. Yes. Yeah, so both. You so, ran the VPN on your phone, and that's what it connected to. It ran the VPN on the router. So the thing I was running into is trying to get the mister just tethered to my phone over a Wi-Fi hotspot worked, but the proxy wouldn't work. And I think it's just the T-Mobile, like my wireless, sorry, my phone carrier, or maybe it's an iPhone thing. But the proxy has to talk on a specific port, and it was uh. just not letting traffic on just whatever. It only wanted traffic on certain ports for security i don't know whatever reason right it wasn't working so, so i was like well if i can liberated your port yeah i was like if i can wrap all of this in a vpn then it will work because that so all that traffic it becomes opaque to my phone basically it yeah. doesn't know what's happening at that point uh kind of <laughs> you know but the problem is i couldn't run a vpn on the mister directly i can't run a vpn while hot spotting my phone and I couldn't run a VPN on UMW's network either. They don't allow this it. This has to be blogged because there's no way you can do it in a 20 minute conversation. Yeah, I won't. I won't go through all the specifics. But my point is, <laughs> let me just say it was uh, undertaking to get the networking working. <laughs> and here's here's a good look at the micro, what we're calling the micro living room, the 90s micro living room. And you had an NES TV as well. It's the N64. Oh, N64. Um, yeah. Yep. Yep. And and then you also had that awesome kind of micro desk, which you might find in a living room in the '90s. Like I really love that. If you look close at this image, there's a bad day at the Midway CD-ROM game. I think the speakers actually worked. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So it, it's probably important to know because I had a lot of people ask me this of like, hey, how did you know you Jim and Meredith get the actual like where's the actual stuff coming from? And I was like, oh. So like the monitor and the tower, like I said, we bought on eBay. The mister I brought, the keyboard and mouse I also brought. Everything else was thrifted the weekend before. Yeah, that's Saturday. <laughs> that's right, or Sunday. Uh, except for the TV. Yeah. We had... Um, Zach uh, Whalen. Yes, Zach, Zach Whalen, Whalen brought us the TV. Brought the TV. And also the little micro TV on the desk too and some little knickknacks. But, um, yeah. but you know, the, the boom box, the, the, um, the N64 was the arcades, I believe. Um, That's beautiful. And so Tim brought that. The tapes, uh, CDs, games, speakers, that lamp, I think, the desk and the TV stand, all of that was thrifted the weekend before. Um, and it, I'm just so happy with how it turned out. I, it, it's It so came great. out great. It did. It came out great. And I think one of the cooler things is I, I believe Zach Whalen, when he was playing with it, because I'm sure he was a huge fan of it, he was like, oh, check this out. You can bring up, oh yeah, that's a great shot of it. Wonderful. 
Yeah, I love the reclaim hosting. Although reclaim hosting wasn't around in the 90s, we could pretend, right? Yeah. Um, but here's a great, uh, another great shot of, um, and you might have this already, but this is actually the, um, I'm oh. sorry, this is actually the marywashingtoncollege.edu website that someone brought up. I think it was Zach Whalen saying, look, and then you could see all of these original faculty websites from like 96 or 97, like Gardner Campbell's was there. Mm -hmm. It was wild to see that. Yeah, and it was so cool to like, you know, the, the, the limitations of what you could browse were limited by, well, what does the Wayback Machine have from 1998 is the year we actually punched in because I found yeah. out that um, not putting it to 96, that was the first year the Wayback Machine had anything. And 96 and 97 were not just there wasn't a lot there. Um, but, you know, it's 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 accurate in the, the sense that, right, like we were celebrating 30 years of the open web. But the reality is in 1992, most of us weren't using the web yet. No. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so so for a lot of people, this setup would have been kind of close to their earliest experiences with the web if they were there pretty early. And I do mean truly the web, not the internet, right? Like yeah. I mean web pages, right? Absolutely. Um, in that yeah. you probably, if you were there in 92, there wasn't quite a lot yet. And it kind of exploded over the next few years. And you might not have had a brand new computer you were using. And, you know, all these things that we like to think of like, well, in 95, it would have been this and you would have used this and these would have been, you know, but it, that's not how technology works. People are using what they have. Um, so I was really happy that we were able to get things within a few years of as far as period accuracy. Um, but we, you know, as far as the archive go, we set it to 98 because that was um, the earliest we could go with while still having a broad range of stuff people could visit. You know, they could go to like Alta Vista and yeah. even type in some basic search queries that were archived. Um, Mary That's Washington's website was so interesting. I, I think Tim brought it up and he was like, can you believe the Mary Washington website at this time is talking about, hey, students and faculty can request space <laughs> to they get to 10 megabytes on the web. Yeah, they get, <laughs> I think it was literally like 10 megabytes. It was, and he's yeah. like, can you believe they were doing this in 98 and this is what's on this web? Like amazing that we're here it at, is the, amazing, at you know, the Reclaim Open Conference and this is what's here. It was, it was so cool. I saw... A couple of people pull up their call it like their their institutions pages. Um, yeah, it was really rewarding for me to see people sit down and just use the thing. It was so cool. Um, I and yeah, it was amazing. I mean, even when you were testing it, as we kind of played around with it the day before and prepared for the conference more generally, hearing the Windows ninety five chime as it starts up is really yeah. like a trigger of like emotions and memories and like that first experience with the web and all that like this magical new world it, it, your your installation did a wonderful job of capturing um that sense of wonder that i think many of us came to reclaim open with an idea of like you know how do we how do we remember that and like what's mm -hmm. a way to keep that at the forefront of our minds you know as the web continues to change and shift and all the things right and, and I, th I think it kind of retroactively ended up tying into a theme that I felt sort of proud to see emerge at the conference. Not that it was my doing, I, I should say, but more like proud of the community, which was a, a, a theme of like, we're looking back, not just for nostalgia's sake, right? But we're looking back and thinking about how things worked and what that means and what we can take from that, right? Yeah. Because, and this I thought was kind of a good example because it's like, you know, we can be nostalgic about the web. Go use Netscape 3 on Windows 95 uh, running 46. <laughs> it crashes a lot. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's, it's not particularly fast. It's really fun. And I was so glad. But like, you know, it, there you got to look at some of the wrinkles, too. And yeah. remember, and obviously some of it was the setup, right? Like we're looking in an archive. So we had some people try to use um, some search engines at the time like um like hotbot <laughs> you know and and uh yahoo of course um but and some of that wasn't completely archived but it's also probably important for folks to remember too like 
even in 98, like search engines, yes, they existed and people used them. They Google wasn't really a thing quite yet. You know, it was no. just about. Um, it, but uh, Google not, was a revolution for a reason in yeah. two, 99, 2000 or whenever that hit big. I think it was like 2000. I think in 98 there was a preview. Uh, in fact, I think I have it bookmarked in Netscape in that thing. That's but there's, awesome. there's like a preview uh, version of it that you could use. But um, yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't quite mainstream yet. Um, so. Well, we're out of time, but I just want to say this was an amazing session at the art fair. I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us and talk through your thinking and how you did it. But then also the fact that you promised that you would blog it all is twice as good as that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm definitely going to get to blog it. I, I almost I almost want to do an accompanying stream, kind of walking through some of it, like yeah, with the Mr. Awesome. Plugged in at some point too. Um, but yeah, I need to blog it because honestly, the networking journey here was a little bit harrowing, <laughs> um, yeah, but we got it to work. It worked. And I had a backup plan of like, well, we could run like DOS games and that'll be fun. But I, I will say like, I mentioned that um, when we were setting this up at Meredith's house just to test things out days before yeah. the conference. And Tim was like, no, you get you got to get the network. This is this is super cool. <laughs> this, is, this is the web. He was like pulling That's up awesome. his friend's band's web page. Like, and... So cool. <laughs> so. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Taylor, for everything and really for a brilliant art share, art fair share. Thanks. Yeah.